Hi, as uh, Deidre said, I am director of the, and the whole title is Max and Tessie Zelikovitz Center for Jewish Studies, which I think is a particularly appropriate name for a center for Jewish studies, bringing in you know, both sides and memorializing. It's with really great, very great pleasure that I'm welcoming you all here uh, to this conference whose title, and as you will see, if not now, when, Responsibility and Memory After the Holocaust. As the title suggests, this is a conference, a conference focusing on the Holocaust or the Shoah, but specifically looking in two directions, towards our understanding, memory, and memorializing of the Shoah on the one hand, and towards our social and personal responsibilities in the wake of the Shoah on the other hand. Uh, that's the if now, when, the injunction that, if not now, when, the injunction that we remember and act now. We at the Zelikovitz Center have been given this opportunity, for which we are very grateful, to focus in both directions as a result of the unique opportunity posed by Canada's assumption of the chair of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance in March 2013. For us at the Zelikovitz Center, this is a serendipitous moment. Some, not quite 10 years ago, a group of scholars started working together and focusing on Jewish studies. We were set up as what's called at Carleton an organized research unit. And at that point, we discovered really by chance that in addition to one professor of Jewish studies in religion, there were actually over 25 faculty members at Carleton who were working broadly in the area of Jewish studies from a variety of different disciplinary perspectives. More significantly, we learned that between 10 and 15 of them were focusing on the Holocaust. Again, from the perspective of history, from the perspective of film, of literature, of art, of psychology, of thought, and of ethics. Uh, the more than half of those were young, and I think that's very important in light of the fact that, what, some 20 years, 30 years before that, there had been someone who announced at a research conference, basically, we we're at the end of research on the Holocaust. We have did it. We've gone through the uh, whole period. We've gone through a generation. In fact, at that point, we were proving them wrong by this kind of vitality. And you will see in today's conference, as you look at your schedule, that in fact the interest by young people continues. You will see that there is a concurrent conference uh, star involving graduate students who will be pre uh, presenting work in progress on the Holocaust. And you will see also that, this, uh, that the names of, the, uh, of those involved in the graduate students suggest that they come from a very wide range of ethnic and religious backgrounds. Again, this is very interesting because what has happened and I think that those in the Jewish community may be less aware of this, is that the Holocaust has become a moment for those involved in thinking about the nature of civilization and in the nature of our place within our world. All of us have come to rethink and to think hard about basic premises. Because of our cross-disciplinary involvement and because of the depth of the research that's been undertaken by scholars in the, uh, in, in the Zelikovitz Center, last year we were promoted, in effect, and designated as a Carleton University Research Center. At the same time, we began to recognize the degree to which the work in the center has been made more, more vital by the university's capital connections that we talk about, its connections to the international diplomatic world, its connection to the world of international agencies, and its connections to parliamentarians and to our public servants. If this conference points in two directions, past and future, it also brings together two sources of energy. On the one hand, the work of scholars and researchers, on the other, the work of those involved in the practical, real-world business of shaping public policy, educational curriculum, and, we hope, social realities. This conference gives us the opportunity to focus on and to celebrate both. While we have a long list of sponsors and organizations with which we are affiliated and to whom we should be expressing th thanks throughout the conference, 
this is not the place to express those thanks individually. You can look at the back of your programs, you can look at the uh, back of other programs as well, and we will be talking about those. But there is, of course, one person and one organization whom we must thank today. And that, it, and that organization is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, and the individual is Dr. Mario Silva in particular. He is currently chair of what we will call the IHRA from this point. I'm sure that most of you know about uh, Dr. Silva, but let me tell you a little bit about him. Dr. Silva is an international legal scholar and a former Canadian politician. He was born in Portugal and is the first person of Portuguese background to serve in our parliament. He was educated at the University of Toronto, the Sorbonne, Oxford, and he got his PhD in law at the National University of Ireland. This can give us a clue to his international interests and to something about his focus. After a stint in municipal politics in Toronto, he served as a federal MP for Davenport from 2004, when, according to my calculations, he was still in his 30s, am I right? <laughs> and. Um, uh, and he served there until 2011. In his tenure as Liberal Member of Parliament for Davenport, he served as the official opposition critic for foreign affairs in the Americas after having served as critic for the Treasury Board and Labor. Throughout the years, Dr. Silva has been a champion of human rights. De Silva chaired the inquiry panel of the Canadian Parliamentary Coalition to Combat Anti-Semitism, which took place in, here in Ottawa just a few years ago. And he is here, as I said before, in his role as the chair of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. In 2007, the President of the French Republic bestowed him the title of the Knight of the Order of the Legion of Honor. He has also been awarded the Order of Merit of Portugal and the Order of Rio Branco from Brazil. He is recognized, obviously, by international bodies for his work there. But equally important, when in fact I mentioned to a couple of people I knew something about the conference and that in fact we would be having, uh, that we were working closely with Dr. Silva, they all said, Mario Silva, he's amazing. He's such an extraordinary person. I said, I recognize that. Look at all the international honors that he's had. And I mentioned them. And they said, oh, no. What he really deserves is the international award in Menschlichkeit, in being a fine human being. I bring you Dr. Mario Silva. Thank you very much. They don't need the podium, maybe. You don't need <laughs> Thank you very much, and you must have been speaking to my mother. Um, I'm honored to be here. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today as chair of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. I'd like to salute uh, Dr. Dietrich Butler at Carleton University and Max Tessie. Zelakovich, Center for Jewish Studies, for organizing this conference. And to thank also distinguished speakers you will hear from over the next couple of days for agreeing to offer their insights. Allow me to start with a quote from Elie Wiesel. Not to transmit an experience is to betray it. Basing their actions on racist beliefs and anti-Semitic ideology the Nazis killed six million Jewish men, women, and children by the time the war ended. The remembrance of the past and the millions of those who perished in the Holocaust is the best or the least we can do to honor their memory. The memory is what we owe to the victims, survivors, and to ourselves, so that never again is not just a hollow slogan but a promise to the victims that has been fulfilled. Each of us has a role in helping the world remember not only what happened, but why, how hate and intolerance transform neighbors into victims and perpetrators. It was in the spirit of keeping the memory alive that the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or IRA, came into being in 1998. 
at that time with the name of the Task Force for International Cooperation. IRA is the only intergovernmental body devoted exclusively to the memory of the Holocaust and is uniquely in that consists of mixed both government, diplomatic representatives, and non-governmental Holocaust experts, academics, museum professionals, educators, and researchers. Its 31 member states are governed by the principle of the Stockholm Declaration, which emphasizes the importance of upholding the terrible truth of the Holocaust against those who deny it, and of preserving the memory of the Holocaust as a touchstone in our understanding of human capacity for good and evil. Later today, you will hear from Minister Jason Kenney, who spearheaded Canada's bid to join IRA. He will outline the Government of Canada's various initiatives in support of Holocaust commemoration. I'd like to focus my remarks this morning on international cooperation on three principal areas of IRA, education, remembrance, and research. Education is essential to pre preventing and overcoming ignorance and hate. That's why IRA has put education initiatives at the heart of its mandate. Through IRA, education experts from around the world are brought together to provide expertise, advice, and recommendation. As a result of this effort, comprehensive guidelines for teaching about the Holocaust has been developed and published in 18 languages. It is important that we talk about the Holocaust as the end of a process. The physical attacks and destruction of property, the legal repression, the exclusion, and the final act of genocide. Erwin Calder, who will hear speak to you later, is particularly eloquent in this process and the lessons it provides us. A clear and well-informed understanding of the Holocaust helps help students understand other genocides, mass atrocities, and human rights violations. But we know that teaching about the Holocaust is not easy. It's a complex topic that demands of educators a high level of sensitivity and a keen awareness. Last year, I attended the annual Holocaust Education Symposium for high school students run by the Sarah and Heim Neuberger Holocaust Center in Toronto. Kay Andrews of the United, uh, University of London Holocaust Education Program, someone who has undertaken a significant study of teachers' perspectives on teaching the Holocaust in the UK, was the keynote speaker. Perhaps not surprisingly, Kay found that one of the biggest challenges is prioritizing uh, content within limited curriculum time. How do you do justice to the scale and complexity of the Holocaust? How to move young people without traumatizing them? How best to, uh, do we enrich students' learning in a world influenced by popular culture and its sometimes distorted, distorting effects? And why teach and learn about the Holocaust when other crimes against humanity are perpetrated these days? These are just some of the issues that IRA experts grapple with. The challenge is particularly acute in some regions of the world where Holocaust memory is fragile and countries still in a process of emerging from the former Soviet Union, for example. Countries like Ukraine, where some one quarter of the Holocaust victims died, and where Nazi and Stalinist crimes are intertwined in sometimes competing memories. To an extent, that is also true in places like Hungary. So continued engagement on education tools and outreach is critical. That's true here in Canada as well. As part of the process to join IRA, Canada has had to examine its own history and relation to the Holocaust. We had to confront, as all IRA member countries do, the darker corners of our history. As many of you know, Canada's, Canada's doors were closed to all Jews, refugees desperate to flee Nazi Germany. This is well documented in Hirsch Troper and Irving Abella's landmark book, None is Too Many which celebrated its 30th anniversary last year and remains as relevant and, and, dist and, and disturbing a read. But still not a well-known part of our history. The Association of Canadian Studies in 2009 studies 
that 54% of Canadians believe that Canada welcomed Jews and refugees during the Second World War. But in fact, Canada has one of the lowest rates of Jewish refugees accepting during that time. So the preservation of Holocaust memories is not something we should take for granted. The voices of survivors bearing witness through their personal stories are an integral part of Holocaust educations and remembrance. I was in Poland last week to take part in several moving events to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Warsaw Get Uprising. The uprising was the first major act of civilian resistance to the Nazis in occupied Poland and stands as an inspiration of defiant heroism and resistance against hatred. I'd had the deep honor of meeting survivors from that uprising. But those opportunities to meet and talk with survivors, which are special for anyone who has had the privilege, are becoming increasingly rare. Sadly, they are passing on. The preservation of these oral and written testimonies is of particular importance at a time when anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial are on the rise. Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism, it implicitly, it implicitly sanctions, is often dismissed as nothing but an empty rhetoric. But it is increasingly clear that Holocaust denial and trivialization that is no longer confined to the political fringes. We are mindful of Primo Levi's warning that those who deny Auschwitz would be ready to remake it. In 2009, IRA established a standing committee on anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial to address this urgent issue. Holocaust denial and anti-Semitic comments are unacceptable. They must be swiftly and publicly denounced by governments. Remembrance. Education is critical, but so too is promoting a culture of remembrance. Central to this conference theme of ensuring memory after the Holocaust. To this end, increasing focus in, in play, is placed on Holocaust memorialization in the form of literature, museums, memorials, and monuments that attempt to make Holocaust memory meaningful for future generations. I will focus on forms of cultural remembrance that seek to anchor the Holocaust in the collective memory of contemporary and future societies. Particularly important is attached to memorials at historic sites of the Holocaust, memorial museums as cultural sites of memory and remembrance, the impl implementation and form of Holocaust of National Holocaust Remembrance Days. Our experts develop guidelines for, for commemorative events and make the links between those events and the necessary education components. An extraordinary amount has been achieved in IRA's member countries to ensure that Holocaust has a permanent place in their national collective memory. But the work is ongoing and IRA countries come to terms with their own Holocaust history. Last year, for example, the Norwegian police apologized for their role in the deportation of 722 Jews deported to Norway during the war. And in Belgium, the mayor of Antwerp and Brussels, for the first time, apologized for the municipality's role in the deportation of Jews from Belgium in 1942. The Belgium Senate also passed a resolution in January this year, recognizing the role of Belgian authorities in the Holocaust. Because the Holocaust was a failure of humanity, remembering it is our duty, our obligation to the future. Which is what the United Nations acknowledged in 2005 resolution that created the International Holocaust Remembrance Day commemorative every year on January 27th. Other international bodies, like the European Union, UNESCO, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, are increasingly focused on different aspects of Holocaust memorialization. Better coordinating these efforts is one of the main goals, as, as one of my main goals as chair. Research. Since this is a university crowd, I'd like to close with a few words about the importance of Holocaust research. The Stockholm Declaration is committed to throwing light on the still obscure shadows of the Holocaust. I meet people from time to time who ask me, 
hasn't everything been written about the Holocaust already? And certainly, in the, certainly the Holocaust is without doubt one of the largest areas of historical in inquiry in the world. And yet so much work remains to be done. Our Holocaust efforts have identified two major areas of focus. First, the accessibility of, of Holocaust era archives. And secondly, research into thousands of killing sites that lie outside the six major death camps. The archival issues is important because anecdotal evidence suggests that hundreds of millions of documents related to the Holocaust history still remain inaccessible in both private and state archives around the world. Still, while hurdles exist to full accessibility, important progress is being made. IRA was involved in the agreement that opened the archives at the International Tracing Services in Bad Arsenal, Germany, in which over 50 million Holocaust era and immediate post-war documents once held by the Red Cross are now stored. These archival collections have tremendous memorial, moral, and scholarly significance. They will, they will be of profound value in revealing the fate of the estimated 17.5 million touched by the tyranny of the Nazi regime. On research, killing sites are still a new area of inquiry. The Holocaust is mostly associated with Auschwitz and with industrial scale killing of death camps. But more than 2.5 million Jews and thousands of Roma Sinti people in Eastern Europe were killed between 1941 and 1944 by what Father Dubois has called the Holocaust by bullets. The most infamous site is Babi Yard in Ukraine, I, a site I visited with Minister Kenny last month and where over 33,000 Jews were killed over two-day period. Hundreds, even thousands of these sites of mass murder have yet to be identified, marked, or memorialized. So this is important work to pursue in cooperation with many institu institutions involved. There will be a major international conference on the subject in Poland next January. In Canada, we will support new research through international academic conferences that will take place on October 6 to 7 at the University of Toronto. The theme is new scholars, new research on the Holocaust, and will target young scholars. A steering committee, co-chaired by Dr. Michael Maris and Doris Bergen, will oversee the conference program. I have now reached the end of my remarks. In a few moments, we will hear from Ambassador Bennett, who, will leads, the, who leads the government's Office of Religious Freedom. There are obvious links between IRA priorities and the work of the ambassador and his office. For as long as we see discrimination based on ethnicity, religious, and other grounds in the world, then clearly there's a role for education, research, and remembrance of the Holocaust. Thank you for this opportunity to speak here today, and I wish you all the best in the conference.